Welcome to the Center for Universal Oneness. We are an open, welcoming, spiritual community that supports all faith traditions and invites you to join us on your spiritual journey. We host different speakers each week to guide and inspire us. We are guided by universal principles of acceptance of all that is sacred, and we strive to live in the oneness of love. Please enjoy this presentation. So again, my name is Mitch Austin. Uh, I'm a ministerial intern. I've been a practitioner for over 12 years, and I've been teaching this inner critic workshop now for almost seven. And it's one of my favorite things to teach. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of, I think, really great tools and information on the inner critic out there. So that's why I love teaching it. And people have had profound shifts. In, um, in just some of the information that I'm going to share with you today. We're going to do this workshop in two parts. So the part that we're going to do today is going to be the first half of the inner critic. It's being recorded. And then I'm going to come back and do a second half that will focus more on, on tools. Uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be doing it via Zoom uh, in November, the second half of the workshop that'll get even more into the tools and some other things we can do around our inner critic. But before we dive into the workshop, I would like to get us centered and present for today's activities. So I'm just gonna invite everyone to um, either take a seat or uh, get comfortable as I do a centering and a spiritual mind treatment. So together, let's take a collective breath in. And on the exhale, just letting go of anything that's come before this moment. Another deep cleansing breath in. And just allowing yourself to become fully present in this time and this space allowing the chair to fully support your body, allowing your shoulders to relax, feeling the rise and fall of your chest as you breathe in and breathe out. And as we turn within to that inner chamber of our soul, of our being, of our presence, I invite the high wisdom of our highest self to be present with us as today's workshop as unfolds. Knowing that what needs to be said will be said, what needs to be heard will be heard, what needs to be healed will be healed, and what needs to be revealed will be revealed. As we journey together, each of us an inlet and an outlet for the presence by whatever name you call it. And so I simply give thanks for this time in community, this time to connect, to grow, to share, to laugh, to wonder, and to explore. And I know that today's meeting is here by divine appointment, each and every person who comes to this work comes by divine appointment. And, and I simply honor that, knowing that each of us gets exactly what we need for our journey. And so I simply let go of this word, I rest in it, I turn it over to the divine mind. I let go, I let good, and together we say, and so it is. All right, and so it is. So a couple housekeeping items as we uh, get ready to start the workshop here is you will need at some point, you'll need access to a device, whether it's a cell phone or an iPad, you are gonna need to, um, there'll be a link dropped in on the Zoom. So for those present in the room, um, if you can join us on Zoom and just mute your volume, when the link gets dropped in, it'll be much easier for you to do the quiz portion of the workshop. So I'll just invite you to start that process now. Um, there are some handouts that people in the room have. 
uh, but we'll make sure that you get them as well. Uh, and we'll do our best to pull them up on the screen for those of you who are, who are joining us virtually. Uh, my workshops are interactive. No two of my workshops are ever the same because I like them to meet people where they are at, whether they're in the room or online. So there will be times I'll ask for your participation. And what I know is each of us is not only a student, but we're also a teacher for each other. So the more we can share what we're experiencing, the more we're helping everybody go deeper into what's being presented in the workshop. So I do invite active participation and I'll do my best to um, help those online participate as well as people in the room. And, and we'll just see how that goes as we move through the material. So I'm gonna go ahead now and share my screen and bring up my PowerPoint. So we can, and you're gonna see me in the PowerPoint. Here I am in the PowerPoint. I've never been in a PowerPoint before. So it's kind of fun. Uh, I love this little uh, graphic here. You drew me all wrong. <laughs> As if, you know, your inner critic had a, a specific shape. Oh, oops, there we go. There we go. So as I said, um, it's participatory. And I would say what happens here stays here, but this is being recorded. So I'd like you to be mindful of that. And there may be other people that watch it as well. So share according to your comfort level, knowing that this is recorded. And, and if everyone could mute, that'd be great. I know it's hard sometimes to find the mute. Also in our shares, share what works for you uh, and also bring a, respect all opinions because an opinion is an opinion. It's valid for that person. Like I said, there are two parts to today's workshop. And the first part, we're gonna focus on getting to know our inner critic better and discover what types of inner critics we have and some affirmations and quotes we can use to work with our inner critic. Now, I don't know if you know this, but according to Jay Early's work, who does uh, internal family systems, there are not one, not two, not three, but seven, seven types of inner critic. I know one's bad enough, but uh, <laughs> we're gonna look at uh, in the quiz that I put together. The quiz is something I created based on his seven types. You'll get to figure out which ones are your more dominant inner critic. And then we'll, look at some quotes and affirmations that'll help us neutralize that voice. Part two, when we do this in November, we're gonna get into more specific strategies and tools uh, to work with our inner critic, as well as a, a really powerful meditation. So we're gonna learn more about our inner critic, increase our understanding of what it wants and needs and work with some of the tools. You know, I love this quote by, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, she said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. That includes your inner critic. <laughs> I love this little cartoon. Congratulations, Mr. Menglin. We've successfully removed your inner critic. If only it were that easy. <laughs> So until we unhook from the inner critic's hold on us and understand how it works and why it does what it does, we will essentially believe everything it says and stay a victim of it. Astra Nedra is somebody who I've looked at a lot of her material. She's, she actually specializes in the inner critic subject. Uh, she's out of Australia. So I recommend that um, if, if you're interested in doing some more of a deep dive, looking up her work online, it's really quite excellent work around the inner critic. So before I get into the next few slides, I'd like to hear a little bit from people online and in the room. What is it? that drew you to the inner critic subject and maybe what you would like to get out of it today. So 
those of you online, if you could start to type that, and then I'm going to um, ask people in the room to go ahead and share with the group today what they would like to get out of it and what drew you to the subject. Who would like to go first? Well, I'm interested in the, in the topic because I'm more interested in the larger topic of which it's part. And that has to do with judge making judgments. Because I find that <clears throat> my own inner critic tends to spill over into making judgments about everything else. Ah. And I'm trying to tame uh, my propensity for judgment into a more forgiving and allowing frame of mind. Got it. So anything I can do to silence the inner critic will be a step in that direction. Excellent. So you want to keep your inner critic from becoming your outer critic. That's right. I like that. Awesome. Great goal. And thank you for describing that. That's that's a really wonderful goal. Who else? Um, maybe Kyle could read some of the comments from the other people. I'm seeing some here. I got one from Pat. She says, understanding how to stop it before the critic gets on a roll. <laughs> yeah, we don't want the critic to roll or run the show. I love that. That's that's the one uh, type in we got. How about anyone else? I am a long time, excuse me. I've been involved in self-development for a long time. I used to call it self-improvement. Mm -hmm. Now I call it self-development. And um, I'm learning some interesting things, such as I always thought I was very self-aware, and now I'm just I mean, not so much. <laughs> so um, this is part of that journey, is figure out what my inner critic is telling me that is perhaps true and what is not. Wonderful. Yeah. Growing in awareness and sorting out that voice of the inner critic, because it's a great exaggerator, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great storyteller, all kinds of things going on. Mitch, I'm, I'm becoming uh, pretty good at isolating the negative stuff that comes up, but getting rid of it. Right. Like, right. Purging. Right. From the... Uh, like in the moment, right? Is, the, is another thing that I would really like to get. What do we do with it in the moment, right? So yeah, and and here's the deal: it's it's really more about right sizing it and understanding its role, so it stays in its lane. And we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah, because it likes to get outside of the lane. Tim here says, as a lifelong social introvert, I think that taming my inner critic might help me become more comfortable socially. Yes, absolutely, Tim. Um, and, and there's actually an inner critic type. Once we look at that, I think is going to really uh, help go deeper within this for you. So thank you so much, Pat and Tim, for your shares as well. Anyone else? Yes. You know, I'm really like this. This is practical. You know, mm -hmm. like this. But I'd like to, uh, well, I lost my thought. <laughs> okay. Lost my thought. Well, so, we have a whole workshop. Yeah, at the shop, exactly. thought, the thought will come back when it needs to. Yes, Absolutely. I came with an open mind to try to see what you have to tell me about it. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, so that I can know. Uh, like Doug, I want to tame, but that's really what we're all here mm -hmm. for. I, I want to stop being so darn judgmental. Yes. And, um, and, and figure out kind of how to let that be. Awesome. So, awesome. Well, you're all brave because you had to get past your inner critic to get here today. So you all get a gold star. You're winning right off the bat. So what is the inner critic? There's a lot of different definitions of the inner critic. Um, the one I like to use is the collective voice of the world that operates through the ego. That part of ourselves that believes we are what we have, what we do, what others think of us, and that we're separate from one another. And this voice of the world really means well for us. It really wants us to be safe and it wants us to do well in the world. So we gotta know the rules of the road. We gotta know how to be a good human <laughs> is really what our, our uh, inner critic is trying to achieve. Um, 
The inner critic is not unique to any one culture. Uh, it's found all over the world. And it, and it shows up differently in different places. For instance, in Australia, they have a very different view about standing out. You know, in America, you're supposed to stand out and be number one, right? In Australia, they're like, no, 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 no. Don't stand out because the tall poppy gets its head cut off, right? <laughs> so it's a very different value in Australia than America. And so the inner critic shows up differently based on these norms and the culture that you're part of. So how does the inner critic impact our lives? What are some of the ways the inner critic has impacted your life? Has it ever kept you stuck? Well, it certainly can inhibit your expressiveness in social situations. Yes, because we care what people think. We're supposed to care what they think. It's very important because then they'll judge us. And then that might say something about whether we're worthy or not, right? We tend to see the reflection of our worth in other people's judgments. That's part of the inner critic uh, spiel to us. Individually, it can make us competitive, selfish, play small, immobile, create human doings. Anybody ever met a human doing? <laughs> they get a lot done. You might be one, right? You get a lot done. And there are some ways we are, the, some ways our inner critic drives us that the world rewards. And we'll get into that. It's especially our inner critic is a dream robber because it tends to get into a discussion with you that's not its discussion to have with you. And I'll get into more of that as we go through the different <laughs> types. Collectively as a human race, it makes us kind of push towards this competitiveness, the separation, the end justifies the means. It's the mind behind fear-filled policies. It's the voice of fear collectively in our world. It leads to toxic cultural stories, harshness, us versus them. It's very divisive. So, I want to get into a couple things about the inner critic um, so that we can understand its psychology as if it were a person. It's actually a sub-personality within us. And we also have the observer and we have the champion within us. We have other sub-personalities that, that show up. But I want to focus specifically on what is the logic loop that the inner critic keeps using us to be on a hamster wheel of trying to become enough or worthy, right? There's a definite thought process behind that. Then we're going to talk about some of the disguises. It shows up in many different ways, some ways that may actually be surprising to you. And then uh, we'll get into some memes and little mind programs that support this inner critic voice. So here's the inner critic logic loop on the top, the have, do, be model. Who's heard of that? Anybody ever heard of the have, do, be? Yeah, so here, here it says, if I have more money, I will do more fun and interesting things and I will be what? Happy, very good. Or if I have a partner and we do really wonderful, fun, loving things together, I will feel Happy. happy, loved, enough. Now, what the problem is when the partner's gone or the money's gone or the thing is gone, you're not happy, loved. Okay, so you guys pass. Good job. The truth is the sustainable model of manifestation is a be, do, have model. And I think that's really what a lot of the ancients teach, right? When Jesus was at the well, with the woman and said, if you drink of those waters, the have, do, be, you will thirst again. But if you drink of my waters, you will never thirst again. Jesus is saying, if you go within, right, the God being the Christ consciousness within, and you're being love, you're being happiness, you don't need anything on the outside to make that happen. You're always the source of it. So, you know, I, uh, I do a lot of spiritual counseling and I often get people who come to me and they say, I want to find the love of my life. 
And I go, great. And then I ask why? And then they say, because I want love in my life. I go, great. And then I said, will you be willing to have love in your life no matter how it shows up? And then we start this little experiment. I said, would you be willing to be love? And then as you're being love, you're doing loving things and you will always have love. And then they sit and they think for a while and it becomes very hard because we get attached to the idea that my good must come through this form, right? And it takes a minute for them to unhook from the attachment and then lean in to this very different way of being in the world. Here's the thing, when you're do, using the be, do, have model, the inner critic doesn't have the hooks. It doesn't have the carrot to throw out there anymore, right? So, you know, it's important to understand what operating system your mind has adopted. And this will help you understand why the voice that's telling you to do certain things is telling you, being very convincing. So I love Wayne Dyer. Any Wayne Dyer fans? Huge. That's why I'm here. <laughs> he hooked me years ago. Are you letting your life go by in frustration and worry over not having enough? If so, relax and remember that you only get what you have for a short period of time. When you awaken, you will see the folly of being attached to anything. And be assured, your inner critic is attached to a lot of things. So the disguises of your inner critic, it's tricky. It's tricky. It uses doubt, delay, distract, and confusion to control you. Because here's its version of safe. Its version of safe is either only doing what it tells you to do or being immobile. That's it. And it likes to keep you just the way you are. That's why growth is so uncomfortable because you have to change to grow. And that makes your inner critic nervous. Anybody ever have a revelation and your inner critic like reared up because it wanted to know all of a sudden what that meant? Like we create our reality with our thoughts. Oh my God, what kind of thoughts are you thinking? You know, like, like all of a sudden it just goes crazy and starts judging you. That's part of the, the inner critic trying to reel you back in, keep you safe keep you small. So doubt is the most common party hat of the inner critic. The other disguise it has is delay and delay and distraction work together. Delay says to distraction, look, you distract him. And then when he's done being distracted, I'll convince him he doesn't have enough time. You ever decide you were going to go do something and you're walking towards the door and you're like, oh, I got to change the laundry. And then, and then before you get to your keys, oh, but I've got to make sure. And you, like you get 10 different distractions before you can even get out the door. Am I the only person? Yes. Yes. So this, there's, there's a method, you know, you make that decision. I'm going to write the book. And you go to the writing desk and you're like, oh, but the cat's out of food, right? So it's, it's something that's going, it's sneaky. It's sneaky. It doesn't play fair. So you got to look for these little things. And, and behind the distraction and the delay is a feeling. And that feeling tone is usually one of anxiety. That's why you're going to go to the distraction or I'll do it next week right? It's trying to keep you from making progress because if I keep you from making progress, I keep you safe. You don't have to write anything down that somebody could criticize, right? Or whatever it is, switching jobs or retiring, whatever it is. The fourth um, disguise is the most subtle and the one that I think people don't always tap into and that is confusion. And being in the group that we're in, I can say this, and I think, I think most people will agree, there's a high part of truth in us. There's a truth compass we always have access to, to know what to do. Confusion is not a real thing, right? God's never confused. Spirit's never confused. Confusion is a human creation or concept. So when someone comes to me and they say they're confused, I know their inner critic has been at work. 
trying to create a smoke screen so you won't get clarity because clarity moves what? Providence, it moves, puts you into action. A lot of people want clarity because they know if I have clarity, I can move towards something. But the inner critic knows if you have clarity, you will move and I don't want you to move. So I will make you confused. I know I had this experience of this when I was uh, in my dating years ago, I had met this woman and um, two months in, I knew we shouldn't be together, right? But my mom liked her, the only one she liked. So I hung around, I thought, well, maybe it'll get better. <laughs> hung around for eight years. And at the end of eight years, I kept saying, I'm so confused. I don't know if I should stay. I wasn't confused. I was not confused. I was afraid. I was afraid. That's what I was. And confusion was a better place to land than to have to deal with my fear. So when somebody comes to me in session work and they say, I'm confused, I go, I turn the, the, the I shift the question and I go, what are you afraid of? See, that discussion will get us underneath this, this mind fog that's being created because that mind fog is trying to protect you from your own fear or feelings of fear and what I know is is when once I got to where I, what I was afraid of I thought who's gonna love me look at me you know all the all the all of this inner critic judgment of my lack of worthiness to be in relationship that's what I was afraid of right so there's these four disguises that we can work with as we um, pay attention to our mind, right? Standing guard at the doorway of our mind because the inner critic does have a place in our life. I bet you're wondering what it is. <laughs> the inner critic's role and its purpose and what it, it can add to our lives is it can help us navigate the rules of the road with intention, the rules of the world, allowing our intention to be translated the way we intended. For instance, I have an old pair of ripped up jeans. Anybody have like the old jeans you like to wear or the old shirt, right? But if I go to an interview, I can't wear those. I can't wear those. I need someone to tell me not to wear those <laughs> if I want to get the job. Does that make sense? Or if I'm in Japan, I would like to know that when somebody hands me their business card, I shouldn't just grab it and stuff it in my pocket. That would be rude. In Japan, you receive it as a sign of reverence with both hands and you bow and you say, thank you. And you look at it and you treat it in a certain way. Now, if I didn't know that rule of the road, which our inner critic knows all the rules, I would offend that person, but I didn't mean to. See, so it helps our intention be translated in the world. You know, even Jesus said, you know, be in the world, not of it. So let's be in it. Let's be in it and let our inner critic have that lane. But it doesn't belong in the lane of judging our worthiness. It doesn't belong in the lane of us moving towards our dreams. It doesn't belong in the lane of us making big changes that feel scary, but that are self-affirming right? When we need to leave a job or a partner or whatever we're doing, right? So it doesn't belong in those lanes, just in this navigating lane of the world. So a couple questions here we can contemplate. And if you have a journal or something to write in, you can journal or you can just think about this question. How is or has your inner critic ex impacted your experience of life or decisions you have made that were not in alignment with your highest desires or needs? How is or has your inner critic impacted your experience of life or decisions you have made that were not in alignment with your highest desires or needs? I stayed in a relationship way too long because of that voice. I put off starting my speaking career because of that voice. What have you put off or what have you kept in your life because of this voice? 
Let's go ahead and if you have a journal, you can write about it or just contemplate it for a second. Fit in the question. So now we're going to do a little bit of the sharing on this question. So for those of you in the room, would you be willing to share how your inner critic has impacted your decisions or your life? I got married, I got married to my second husband because I didn't think that I had, uh, that I would be financially secure. On my own. Oh. After I got divorced from my children's father. And wow. Yeah. And then I knew it was a mistake right away, but I did it anyway. Yep. Inner critic, be yeah. safe. Look, you'll have money. That thing out there you'll have and have to be. And then, and then, you know, of course that didn't work out. So then marriage was off the table. <laughs> <laughs> now you're in critics like, ah, you don't want to do that marriage no, thing. I, I, I'm okay. I'm going to make this mistake. But my younger, right. But my, my younger son said, let's marry Bill. <laughs> let's. let's. Yeah, said, let's. It was a group decision. <laughs> it was a group decision. He said, let's marry Bill. We like him. <laughs> um, thank you for that share. Anyone else? How about online? Do we have anybody? We could uh, unmute and share. Kyle, you'll have to call the hands because I can't see everybody. Ooh, I also cannot see anybody. Um, Nobody's asking. I don't see anybody okay. raising them. All right, how about in the room? I know that I have acquiesced on numerous occasions of the most disguises. Mm. I later said, Dorothy, I'm true to you. I do it less because of job delay, distraction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of them. And how do you feel energetically when you do that? Very, very down. Right, right. It's so destructive. Right. And, the, and the, so now your energetic vibration, right? That's what's being sent out. See, that's why I think it's so powerful to get a hold of the inner critic's voice. Right, because we know we live in a vibrational universe, and and the vibration tones that come with this suppression, with this boxing in, with this critical voice, lowers our vibration. This is not quite on topic. I don't think he brought up Wayne Dyer earlier. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes of his is "Distance yourself from the critic." That helped me end a friendship that was the one sided. Mm. In that case. I found the critic to be brutal. It, it wasn't the end of the chapter at all. But that quote of his was so impactful. He loved people that had said this person not being respectful of me. They could witness um, an unequal relationship, and I was blind to it. Yeah. And so when I read his quote, that's when I stepped back and started looking at it more analytically as other people had brought to my attention. And so I severed that relationship and felt awesome. great. <laughs> well, that's good because sometimes the inner critic gets in there and will judge you about those types of decisions. So that's great that you actually stood in your power and you use the truth, which is a tool to work with your inner critic, is to bring a higher truth to that voice because it's very good at spinning things. It does something that I call fear casting. It'll take a piece of truth, a fact, and it will superimpose some logic and then project like a future event. That's what I call fear casting. So I'll give you an example. I remember when I was doing my first 
big talk in a spiritual center. I'd wanted to speak there for seven years. I'd never done um, a spiritual talk. I'd done other talks. And it was going to be on taming your inner critic. That was the name of the talk. And I got up the morning of, I made my bed and I looked around my room and I had some things in disarray and hanging out. And, and immediately my inner critic comes in and says, really, look at your room. It's a mess. You're going to help people with their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, I know you. I know you. <laughs> Get thee back, right? As soon as it popped in. And, and, and the reason it did that, and, and that wasn't a normal inner critic it was really loud its volume comes up higher and higher the closer you are to making a step up or out a big change a big event it gets louder and louder anybody have experienced that it gets busier it gets splashier and the splashier and louder it gets the harder it is to hear the small still voice our intuition so that's, I think, in part, why we want to be able to identify the inner critic, get past its splashiness or calm it down so we can be in our higher mind, higher with. So here's some fun memes that our little inner critic mind programs. Money doesn't grow on. Great. I'm too... Oh. I'm too, I'm too poor, I'm too whatever, right, to do that. I'm not, I'm not too short. Somebody said too short in the room. I'm too short. Can't reach that, I'm too short. I'm not blank enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I'm not rich enough. And here's the thing. It'll say you're not the not enough and it'll keep pushing you to achieve. But even when you achieve whatever it is, whether it was a promotion or a goal or you wrote the book and then it'll say, good job. Now don't screw it up. <laughs> right. And then it just keeps going. Like, you know, it, you, it's, it's, it's a never end. You never win this discussion. You really need to hear this. You never win the discussion when you're playing by the inner critic's rules. You won't. It know it made it wrote the game. Okay. So just be mindful that if if you're trying to convince the inner critic on its level, that isn't going to work. But there, don't worry, we have other ways to do that. So now we're going to figure out which of the seven inner critic types are predominant types. I know, don't get so excited all at once. <laughs> um, Kyle's going to drop a link in here. Um, you can also find this test on my website, spirituallyspeakingwithmitch.com. If after this exercise, you should feel that your spouse or partner or child should take it. Many people like to have uh, other people take the survey. So you'll see uh, Kyle's link there. It starts with form. Uh, jotform.com. And if you click on that, you can um, take the quiz. And is there anyone who needs uh, a quiz device? I can pull it up here for you. Yeah. I'm, I'm not getting in the internet. Oh, do you need my yeah. Mitch, would you like the seven types up on the screen yet or a little bit later? Not yet. No. Okay. no. I want, I want everyone to get the test done. And um, and then online, when you're done with the test, if you could just type in done, then we'll know that you're complete. I can't get the survey to, to open up. Should I go to the link or so go to that spirituality speaking with Mitch. spiritually speaking with Mitch.com. Is the link that I put in not working? It works. It works. It works for me. Yeah, oh, it okay. is working. Okay. It can work for those of us who have a stronger inner critic. <laughs> <laughs> it's that it's that good at self-sabotage. It only changed its size. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's the questionnaire. Let's 
start. And so you get numbers one, zero to seven. And the more the statement reflects a truth for you, you'll pick a higher number. If it's not as true, you'll pick a lower number. And this is just a fun quiz. It's, it's not, you know, scientifically rigorously tested or anything, but it does help us narrow down uh, the seven types. Or go to chat if he was to chat, you just click on him. Oh, that's a good Yeah, just go to chat. And and when you get to the very end, this quiz automatically totals up your numbers and gives you scores for each of the seven critics. And the highest scores, you want to identify the top three highest. Um, and read those, those are your predominant uh, types of inner critic. Kyle, I sent you a message. I don't know if you saw it. Um, I do not see it. On the chat, you sent it to me? Yeah. Um, let's see. I do not see it. I'll send it again. Oh, gotcha. Let me know when you're done and I'll give you a handout. Oh, yeah. Anyone's good to get. That's some loud typing. <laughs> oh, that's me. So I was just trying to um, gave you the most confusing answer to your question. So I was trying to clarify. Okay, well, I'm judging you. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm not judging you. <laughs> You're judging you right now. It's okay. It's okay. Not I know, All right? <laughs> That'll stir the pot. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Pat. And, and look at your top three. Heather's done. Look at your top three and read those. And if you're tied in your scores for the top three, then just read the tied ones because the descriptions are there in the quiz and just pick one to work with and you can decide which ones fit or not. Great, Tim. And um, for those of you online, maybe you could just type in how that was for you, whether you thought the types that you read your top three types, whether you resonated with those or not, or any other shares about those, about the quiz, how it made you feel. Just go ahead and type it in here and I can share it with everybody. Okay, Ruth Ann's done. Good job. You done? You, you know your three types? Or you can hold on. Okay. Hand out so that he can look at his three types there. You don't need to submit it. Okay, so now you see the totals. So it looks like the top two, which maybe this is the fat master, and then whatever the top two ones are the top three. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Okay. You need these methods. I don't. Good. Thank you. We all have them. All right. We got underminer, perfectionist, and molder. Wow. Hi, Carol. Carolyn. Good job. Excellent. Has everyone done theirs in here? And everyone's got a handout? Yes. That's for it. You're supposed to put it in the chat, right? Oh, I was having the, the online people okay. do that because I have all of you in here and I can sure. quiz yeah. you guys. So, it tells them we'll send this. Okay. Yeah, and we're going to send out the hard copy for you um, along with the backside that we'll go through uh, today as well. Great, Sherry's done. Excellent. Okay, I think we're all... Just about done. Everybody in here is done? Okay. All right, so let's go over. So how was that for people? What, what was that like for you? Kind of like regular psych test. <clears throat> regular. The bubble, see where it goes. Yeah, well, did it go anywhere uh, that you could resonate with or was it helpful? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Uh oh. And you. That also confirmed what I had thought. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of standard. Got confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. So you get confirmation. Would it be this or would it be that because of this or that? So I just, it took me a long time because I had to rationalize this too. When you're looking at each statement, your inner critic was there. Got to get this right. So much pressure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Pat Beagle says it was interesting. Perfectionist, underminer, taskmaster, and inner controller. Wow, Pat, but all, all four <laughs> that you had. And Tim said underminer, perfectionist, molder were the three of his top four. Yeah. 
Good. Okay. Well, let's go through some of these. Um, and we talked a little bit about the questions. So let's go through the types. So um, in the room, everybody has this sheet, but I'm going to read it for those of you online as well as in the room, and then we'll talk about it. So who had the perfectionist? <laughs> Raise your hand online if you had the perfectionist. Okay, I see. I see you. In, three, in your top three. Who had in the top? Okay, we have some perfectionists in the room. So let's read that. Actually, it's one of mine too. So you're in good company. Here's what it says. This critic tries to get you to do things perfectly. It sets high standards for the things you produce and has difficulty saying something is complete and letting it go out to represent your best work. It tries to make sure you fit in and you will not be judged or rejected. Its expectations probably reflect those of the people who have been important to you in the past. So perfectionists, you know the thing called analysis paralysis? Anybody ever get that? Yeah, it's a common affliction for the perfectionists. I know as I look back, and, and many of these voices were cultivated as we were very young growing up, right? That's when our cement was like in our mind was most impressionable. And what I can tell you is I had a diva mother. <laughs> she was, she had actually been a model at one point. So she had very high standards of things. And I think I just internalized that. And this, this I know kind of supported this part of my uh, tendency towards how I move through the world. Anybody have anything to say on the perfectionist? I think um, to a certain extent, <clears throat> from an artist's point of view, that nothing is ever finished. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, I never, it's not, I, I, mm -hmm. I write something or mm -hmm. I'm, I'm directing something. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it it's never finished. There's always something more mm. that can enhance it mm -hmm. help it in some, mm -hmm. some way or mm -hmm. uh, oh i missed that well, i could go back and mm -hmm. so there's and i don't know if that's uh good or bad well, the perfectionist actually is a, a very positive inner critic type in many ways it's one of those inner critic types that the world rewards right the perfectionist does if somebody wants good work they go find the perfectionist well, in places where you demand that, where you need something out in the far right tail of the distribution. Yeah. Um, medical doctor. Yeah. Financial advisor. Yeah. Where is average good enough? Yeah. No. Average brain surgery? No. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I don't want my airline pilot to be having that. <laughs> yeah. They don't want them to have a bad day, right? I Mitch, I think against the perfectionist, the, the real world has helped me. My need to do, my need to, uh, as an entrepreneur, my need to um, get it done, mm -hmm. done is better than perfect. Yeah. And so that has helped me, the, you know, 20 yeah. some years of I've got to bring in the, the money, I got to pay the bills. Yeah. Forget perfection. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. meaningless. I have to get it done and move on. Yeah, absolutely. Previous to that experience. Or even progress is better than just standing there and thinking about it. Okay. Rumination, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when I first created this workshop, I had to battle my inner critic big time. I'd never done anything like this. I didn't have a PhD in anything. Like, who am I? I had the who am I syndrome. My perfectionist was beating me up. I mean, but if I'd never started, this is not the iteration that I started with. The one I started with was not great. <laughs> but it got you started. Yeah. But it got me started. So this is our work, is to be moving through the resistance, but letting it inform the process. So I was perfecting over time, right? And giving myself some room to do that. So Pat Beagle says um, about her inner critics, she says, my mouth says perfection is the enemy of done. Uh, an enemy of done, my actions say, wait, just one more thing. So thank you for that share, Pat. So there we go. 
inner our perfectionist people in the room. So who are our guilt trippers? We got any guilt? Oh, we got a couple out here. We got, I think one or two in here. So let's read about the guilt trippers. This critic is stuck in the past. It is unable to forgive you for wrongs you have done or people you have hurt. It is concerned about relationships and holds you to standards of behavior prescribed by your community, culture, and family. It tries to protect you from repeating past mistakes by making sure you never forget or feel free. I mean, gosh, there is no redemption there. <laughs> not not one bit you know because everywhere you go there you are and it digs up every memory beats you up with it it's a tough one you know who I think was a guilt tripper anybody um no uh Anita Mor Morjani who wrote Dying to Be Me that book familiar with her story she was very trapped in her culture she had grown up uh in the in an Indian culture but in America and was feeling the tensions of culture having to marry who her family wanted. And it was, it's a very interesting story if you wanna uh, get a treatise in, in this particular um, inner critic type and how she transcended it um, is, is really amazing. So our guilt trippers, we have some work to do, um, letting ourselves off the hook, talking to ourselves like we would a friend bringing compassion to ourselves for our past mistakes. Underminers, we got any undermine? We got one in the room here. Let me see if I got any online here. Oh, I keep forgetting this isn't a touch screen. So just trying to see everybody here. Yeah, we have an underminer here. Okay, so let's read it. This critic tries to undermine your self-confidence and self-esteem so you won't take risks. It's really for your own good. Uh, the, it makes direct attacks on your self-worth so you'll play small, you won't take chances so you won't be hurt or rejected. It is afraid of you being too big, too visible and not being able to tolerate judgment or failure. You know, you ever heard that saying, you know you've arrived when the critics show up? It's true. It's true. When we start to stand out, even if we're doing a good thing, there's critics. I love Wayne Dyer's story about how he would get these letters back in the day criticizing him. And the, he took a page out of Art Link Letters book and he would say, I'm reading your letter in the smallest room in the house. <laughs> it is before me and soon it will be behind me. I always like that joke. Anyhow, so standing out comes, any success comes with eyeballs. And just, I, I suspect in Australia, there's a lot of underminers. You would think Australia is loaded up with underminers, right? Because they know sticking out, somebody's going to criticize me. Somebody's going to cut my head off. So, um, there we have to, underminers have to stand in their strength, their resilience, right? And the high truth that people's opinions is not truth and, and clinging on to that understanding. So the next one is destroyer. And I'm not, I'm not gonna ask people to self-identify. This is the toughest of the seven. So I'm just gonna read it. The destroyer, it makes pervasive attacks on your fundamental worth. It shames you and makes you feel inherently flawed and not entitled to basic understanding or respect. It is the most dehabilitating critic. It comes from early life deprivation or trauma. It is motivated by the belief it is safer not to exist. It's, uh, it's a very, very tough, inner critic type. And I really want people to know this inner critic type because once we know some of these types, we can see each other a little bit better. And if we can see that somebody who's really being withdrawn, self-deprecating, depriving themselves of, of things uh, might have this one. Uh, and these are the people, whether it's ourselves or people we come across that really need our love our compassion and our support. 
Um, I have seen over the years as I've done this test with many people, a lot of artists tend to fall into this category, which is interesting to me. Um, so uh, I, I highly recommend anyone who does have this as a dominant inner critic type that this is, this is somebody who needs support, you know, whether it's counseling or therapy or spirituality, some type of support so that they get in touch with the high truth of their divinity, of their specialness, of their worth. So, okay, we got any molders, molders in the room. Oh, there we go. We got one. I see a hand up. Awesome. Heather. Thank you, Heather. Okay, molders. This critic tries to get you to fit into a certain mold based on the standards held by society, your culture, or your family. It wants you to be liked and admired and to protect you from being abandoned, shamed, or rejected. The molders fears, the molder fears that the rebel or the free spirit in you would act in ways that would be unacceptable. So it keeps you from being in touch with and expressing your true nature. So this person isn't going to get on the dance floor. It's not going to happen, right? If we let that inner rebel out in any way, the sky is going to fall. Unless she has a lot of tequila, in which case she gets on the dance floor and she doesn't care. Unless, that was Heather. Tequila breaks through her molder, inner critic. Good job, Heather. It's medicine, medicine for that molder. Love it. <laughs> Anybody else have anything on the molder? I love that. That was great. I have a question. Yes. Can you, can you realize that you have this inner critic, but you have a long history of overcoming what, what the inner critic is telling you? Yes. And in fact, when you, the more you overcome that voice, the more you grow strength and resilience to move past it. Like I have, my perfectionist used to keep me literally stuck everywhere at work, everywhere. And I've gotten better at getting progress, not perfection, progress, not perfection. And the more I've done it, the less that voice has kept me stuck or afraid. Thank you. That's yeah, I think a I great question. With the molder. <laughs> <laughs> yes, awesome. Thank you, great question. Any other questions before we move on? Yeah, just blurt them out if you have them. So let's go on to Taskmaster. Who has Taskmaster? Oh, we got a whole bunch of hands. We got some hands over here. Yes, we got some hands here online. That's my other one. Oh, we got Taskmasters high-fiving in the background for those of you online. So, see, I'm not moving quick enough. We got a Taskmaster in the room. This critic wants you, wants you to work hard and be successful. It fears that you may become mediocre or lazy it, and will be judged a failure if it doesn't push you and keep you going. It's pushing often activates the procrastinator uh, or the rebel that fights against its harsh dictates. You will know when my taskmaster is in full force if you walk into my office and it's spotless <laughs> because I've been procrastinating to do this really big thing and I'm feeling like I got to get something done so I clean my desk. <laughs> Wonderful thing about the procrastinating is we are going to look at things we do today and always something to look forward to. <laughs> It's true. My taskmaster stays in high vibration because of it. Broken like a retiree. <laughs> Anybody else have something to say about the taskmaster? What day is today? Do you get Sunday off with the taskmaster? Every day. So this is the other most rewarded inner critic type by the world. These are your supervisors, your bosses, your CEOs, your, uh, your, you know, presidents of the PTA and all of that. These are the people that will, you know, keep everything going and, you know, keep everything on schedule. And that's not a bad thing. There's nothing bad about that. 
Every it's organization a, needs them. Every organization needs them. But you know, I remember I would come home and I'd forget to take my taskmaster hat off, and my partner would remind me real quick <laughs> that you're not at work anymore. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Whoops. <laughs> you know. So um, but it's hard to find your rest. It's hard to find your balance right with this one always at the helm and and to feel a sense of self-care self-care feels frivolous to the taskmaster i remember it felt frivolous to me until i got sick right so um one of the tasks needs to be no tasks for the taskmaster so that you can show up uh in your best self wherever you go and the last one is inner controller. Who are my inner controllers? We got some inner, yeah, one over here. Okay. I think we have a couple online as well. This inner critic tries to control your impulses, eating, drinking, sexual activity. It is polarized by the indulger, which is the addict who fears it, it gets out of control at any moment, could get out of control any moment. It tends to be harsh, shaming. It wants to protect you from you. It is motivated to try and make you a better person who's accepted and functions well in society. You're feral. It just believes you're feral and you need all of these rules and constrictions so that you won't be and so that you can function properly in society. Now, we do want to function and cooperate with people in society, but the truth is you're not feral. You're divinely made. And the wisdom that comes in from out of the blue won't always match the world's version of what you should be doing. Sometimes we get a calling, a pull, a heart-centered feeling to be something or to show up in a certain way. And so getting past this inner controller, we have to start to validate our own inner wisdom. Very important. And it's true for many of these critics, but especially the inner controller that you can trust yourself to make good, healthy, respectable decisions for your life. All right. Bless you. Absolutely. This is really good. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, this week, a friend of mine sent me uh, a thing from our high school class with all the people in our high school class written on there mm -hmm. and you know where they lived and whether they were alive or dead and our greeting man our greeting all through it and I just to think I said you know I'm living too much in the past this is not good uh, so I threw it away and then my wife what does it say this critic is stuck in the past <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> and good for you you caught yourself did. you did and you made a different decision thank you for that that's awesome that's a kind of a neat kind of synchronicity with the yeah, yeah. Friend, and it, was, it was by far the highest it wasn't super high it was like 18 but my next highest one was like nine so it was really Wow. You know, it's the number one one for me. Nice. <laughs> wow, this must be something to mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. So would you like some tools to work with your type? So on your second page, I'm going to have you look at that. And um, so you're going to see, I don't know if we can move this image over. Let me see if I can. Kyle, is there any way for you to shrink or move or um, people? We can oh, people see. can see it. Never mind. Okay, I was they gonna say see. I also have it on my screen if we want to try that. Yeah, but. I think I think people can see it. So you're gonna look at your you know top three types, and in here you're gonna see what the core belief is with that type, which is really important, right? So that you can start to to identify what it believes. And then you're going to look at the affirmations and quotes and pick one or two that really resonate with you. Pick one or two that resonate with you and you feel are helpful for your inner critic type. 
one or two of the affirmations? Yeah. So you'll look at, so for instance, one of yours is the, um, was it the molder? No. No, it was the guilt tripper. Guilt tripper. So you'll look at the guilt tripper and you'll look at those three affirmations and pick one or two that resonate with you and then go to the next inner critic type that you have. And then and then once we share that we'll we'll be complete with the workshop. So I like on perfectionist, the second one, it does have to be perfect. <laughs> Circle that one. We'll share in a second. We're gonna share them. I like sharing them because there's amazing energy that comes through. I know. <laughs> My perfectionist is very upset. My, and now my taskmaster is like, you really got to get that done, right? <laughs> so we'll take just another minute. <clears throat> picking out which ones, and then we'll, we'll share some of our favorites. And here's the deal. When you're reading these, you might have an affirmation just pop up in your head, write it down or change one of them to fit better what you want. And we're gonna send this form out too, to everybody um, as well, so that you'll have all of them. So does everybody have one or two? We're good? Okay. So anybody online have, uh, let's start with the perfectionist. Anybody have one for the perfectionist they like? If online, if you do, just unmute and share. It doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be perfect to be powerful. Oh. Oh, you said beautiful. Why? Oh, you changed it. I love it. Oh, it's the last one. Life doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. I love it. I was reading a different one. Thank you. Any any perfectionist ones here that you liked? Okay. Let's move on to guilt tripper. Anybody got something from the guilt tripper? Yeah, I've got some questions. Oh, we have a question. Okay. It says, uh, no amount of guilt can change the past, but it can make you repeat it. Mm -hmm. And that I don't understand. What you focus on in your mind is what you tend, like thoughts are things. So if you're focusing on a past event, you're, you're mirroring that vibration, right? And we're in a, we're in a vibrational universe. So even if it's something that you did in your, in your past, mm -hmm. and you think, God damn, I wish I hadn't done that. Right. But the universe doesn't hear done that. You're just vibrating at that level. Like if I say, don't think of a pink elephant, don't think of a pink elephant. Yeah. You're thinking of a pink elephant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do you get over that? The universe doesn't hear, don't. You just say right. nothing about it. Right. Well, not, that's a good question. So here I am ruminating about a past mistake, right? So now, you know, if I use this quote, I say, no amount of guilt can change the past, but it can repeat it. Feeling guilty doesn't help make it better. So it disconnects me from this because I'm trying to fix something in the past by feeling bad about it. And all I'm really doing is recreating that energy in the present. Now I need to let it go. So focus on the second sentence, feeling guilty doesn't help it make it better. Yeah, you can use that one. Yeah. Can you just say, I forgive myself? Yes, that could be one of them. Absolutely. Yeah, I forgive myself. So I don't need to I don't need to go back to that old chapter anymore. Right. And the other thing you can say is I am not that person anymore. Yeah. The person that did that, I'm not that person anymore. Yeah. I'm not that was a different person, different version 
of me. I read a thing recently. It it said that uh, they found out now that studying DNAs, Mm -hmm. that actually your DNA can be influenced by your life events. Oh, yeah. So you you do become a different person. So right. You're not the same person. Exactly. You were in nope. <laughs> nope. Yeah, different, different, different version. It, yeah. Not one cell in your body exists from. Every yeah. And yeah. You don't need to feel guilty. And you don't need yeah. to feel guilty about it. <laughs> there's uh, Brene Brown talks about the difference between shame and guilt. Mm-hmm. The act was bad. The act. Yeah, but shame is, me. I am bad. Right. Yes, thank you for so bringing that up. That can, can make a big confusion. Oh yeah, yeah. Because because the inner critic, if if the inner critic can unlodge your, can discredit your thought process and what you're trying to do, it has control, and that's what it wants. So it'll use anything, even a messy room, right? <laughs> it'll use anything. Underminer. Anybody have one with the underminer they like? In the back, go ahead. Nothing I do, nothing I can do, say, or produce can make me more worthy than I am right now. And as I give myself permission to shine, I give others the gift to do the same. Yeah, you like both of those, right? Nothing I can do, say, or produce can make me more worthy than I am right now. How do we feel about that online? Any questions or thoughts? I see a lot of nice head shaking. <laughs> Here a car starting. <laughs> I think that somebody's leaving. Um, <laughs> did anyone have something under the destroyer? Any of the quotes there that they liked? How about the molder? Online, we got any molder quotes you like? I like the one, uh, freedom of expression of who I really am is my birthright, for I am an expression of spirit. Yes. I like that one. Yes. It's just like number one back from the destroyer. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we kind of blow past it because maybe most of us aren't destroyers, but I am a great idea in the mind of God. That is why I'm here. Yeah, that's powerful. Oh. Like oh. Oh. Sherry just said, only yeah. in different words. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes people will read this one as well. I cannot trade enough parts of myself to ever experience true acceptance or belonging. And and the inner critic will tell you differently. Just make them happy. Just go with the program. Just, Just make an exception to your boundaries this time, right? What does that mean, trade enough parts of myself? So sometimes people will trade their values, their things, their time, everything, every part of their sovereign person. Oftentimes these are chameleon type people, right? They're trading. Sometimes they don't have really have time. They really shouldn't be giving you their time, but they're going to give you that time because they want acceptance. They want love, but they're not acting in integrity with themselves and really with you. Because if I'm not in integrity with myself, I'm not in integrity with you either. If I'm giving you something I really shouldn't be giving you and it's affecting my well-being, I'm out of integrity. So I'm trading a part of myself I shouldn't be because, and I'm doing it because I think you're going to like me. You're going to make me more, more acceptable. And You'll be my friend. You're working with very depressed people. That's one of the things that you will find in their history is that they have been in a relationship usually with a parent Mm -hmm. that was guilting or shaming Mm -hmm. that they kept trading parts of themselves away trying to please that person only to find out that they didn't have any sense of self and it never worked. No, no, it never works. But you work when you, especially when you're young, you do everything you can to try to make the person that is important to you happy. And those people usually are not going to be happy no matter what you do. Right, right. Because you never arrive. That's right. That's the problem. You never arrive and you deplete your resources and then you become disillusioned. 
like happiness is never going to happen for me. And that, and I could see how depression would definitely be it. I, I actually use that a lot in my um, counseling practice because I get a lot of people that, that do that and don't realize they're doing it. So, right, can I ask another yeah. question? Yeah. Super. I've been talking to my son, my boy, Jesse, and I haven't seen him in about a year, and he's got a little boy in there. I've always seen him once. And so, they're not going this fall. And he told me his other, his in laws are coming for Thanksgiving, and they asked me if I wanted to go. At first, I said no. And then I got to thinking about it. I said, well, maybe it would be a good thing to have both sides of the family there, mm -hmm. and his wife, you know, mm -hmm. kind of help you know pull the whole family together you know, right on both sides so i said i called him up and i said yeah i'm gonna come and i told him that yeah and he said but don't don't do that for me just do it if you want to you know, say, well i don't think i'm doing that to make him feel i think i'm being altruistic about that or am i missing something i don't think so what do you think let's pull the audience because here's the thing truth truth shows up like this if you've ever heard of the word book Blink, yeah. we know, yes, by Love Malcolm. We know the truth like this. It comes in real quick, but our mind talks us out of it real fast. So whatever comes in real quick, we need to catch like a firefly in a bottle because that that's our guidance. Our, our, we, we are attuned to the truth. It's our mind that talks us out of it or creates the confusion or the second guessing. Yeah. right or we let allow other people to to come in and make a second guess so no yeah, we all agreed you you yeah. you're you're and that's one of the tools that we're going to talk about in november is how to work with the um, phone a friend so the last uh where are we taskmaster do we have any taskmaster quotes yeah. we like you go okay <clears throat> i'm going to pick and then i'm going to get the Okay. I am a success no matter if I fail, don't try, or choose to work less. My sister sent me a book by a contemporary artist named Agatha, and she sent it to me specifically for one poem, and it's a collection of poems. And I now have that poem in my office at my home. Collect the tribes like trophies, and you can never lose. Oh, I love that. Collect the tribes like trophies, and you can never lose. I try to go for it, I shoot for it. Yeah. I, I can quickly go, oops, yeah. pivoting is a pot, a real, I'm a pivot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. that direction is a wrong one, turn, turn. Yeah. So um, yeah. I love my sister and I love that she sent me that because I- Collect your tries like trophies. And you can never lose. And you can never lose. Thank you for that share. I like the last one. I trust the organic unfolding of the universe to get done what needs to get done. And I can release the rest. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. If God is everywhere, then everything's getting done. And Just you imagine. Any money for your favorite candidate. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to donate any money to your favorite candidate, is what was said in the room. I read the same as in the top. Fail. Yeah. Fail. Again and again. And it's good. And it's good. Yeah, I keep failing. And and soon it'll be all right. Yeah, I'm you're becoming perfect in your book. And the next, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. There you go. Do we have any taskmaster comments online? Any quotes? All right, so we'll move on to inner controller online. Do we have any inner controller quotes we like? Here we go. I really like the one that says, no matter what happens, I am safe, secure, and the sky is not falling. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Hey, <laughs> that's true. We all yeah. like to hear. I I have heard divine order a lot because it it reminds me that I'm not seeing the big picture, and I really don't need to worry about it. God's got God, it. God's got it. I love it. That's great, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. That was beautiful. And the last one there, I like. 
goes back to the shame versus guilt thing about I'm a good person who sometimes makes wrong choices. It's okay. It's okay. We get to be. We get to be human. <laughs> we get to be human. Well, I want to thank everyone for playing full out. I hope this was helpful. Oh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming online as well. Appreciate you. November 20th, we're going to have round two. We're going to really dig into some tools and an amazing healing meditation. You don't want to miss this. It's going to be great. Uh, also, if you want any support around this, sometimes this stirs the pot for people and they want prayer or support. I'm happy to um, support you in any way that I can. You can always reach out to Barb and uh, get my contact. You also know my website now. So spiritually speaking with Mitch.com. I love this community. Thank you so much for having me. And I will pray us out so that we can get to other business like go chiefs. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Deep breath in and just exhale. Another deep cleansing breath in and just allowing ourselves to come back to our center on the exhale. As we turn within to our high truth, our high divinity, the eternal whole part of our being bringing that part of ourselves to all that we do, all that we think, all that we say to ourselves and others, allowing this voice to be at the head of our decision-making table and allowing our inner critic to be in support navigating the world. And so I simply give thanks and know that as we go out upon our week, we are each held directed, protected, uplifted, and celebrated. And so I simply release this word into the one, and together we say, and so it is. Thank you so much, Nick.